Amen. Brethren, you remember uh, Jane, or James, Aaron uh, last week, uh, touching on these first couple verses of James chapter 1, introducing the book to us. Remember, James is written to persecuted Christians. We looked at that last week. Acts chapter 1, big uh, heavy persecution came upon the church. The church was scattered abroad, and they were enduring trials, brethren. And, and, and James is writing to them to encourage them in their trials, calling them to have joy, joy in the midst of the trials, brethren, because the trials produce something. Remember what Aaron said last week? What, 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 what were the trials meant to produce in God's people? Yes, yeah, maturity, right? Yes, maturity. Okay, that, that was the purpose. God had sent them, and because uh, the trials are, are, are sent by God, who's a good God, all good things come from Him. Trials come into our life to produce, to, 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 to have an effect upon us, and that is maturity. Maturity to grow and strengthen the brethren here. And so, and, and as trials are producing something in our lives, maturity, so also, brethren, the way we live, the way we live produces something in the world. It produces something in the world. And I want you to think here for a moment, brethren. You look out into this world, and, and you don't. this is rhetorical. You don't need to shout things out, but you look out into the world, and what do you see? Brethren, the world is broken. We just sing that. I mean, the, 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 there's, there's sin, there's rebellion, there's suffering, there's brokenness, there's conflict, there's wickedness. Things are not good. And yes, God is on the move and God is, 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 is bringing in the kingdom and God is, is saving people and changing lives. Yes, God is doing that. But we don't see that full and complete, brethren. And do you not long for God to come and make things right? we got to long for that, church we got to long. we got to look out into the world and say, Lord, make things right. Fix this, Lord. You just flip, flip on the news. You just read through any, any, any news station, brethren. Brokenness in the world. I mean, does your heart not long? Lord, come and make things right. And brother, we have precious promises in the Scriptures. We have the promises. But we don't see them oftentimes coming to pass. We ought to long for God's glory to cover the earth. Yes. We ought to long for, for wars to cease in all the world. We ought to long, brethren, that, the, the, that our churches be filled with white-hot worshipers of Christ. We ought to long for abortion to be ended. We ought to long for righteousness to be upheld in our nation and in the world, brethren. We ought to long for that. We ought to long for what we read there in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that Christ's kingdom... His rule, the increase of His government and of peace would increase. We want that. Church, we do. We ought to long for it. And for His kingdom to be established with justice and righteousness. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And brethren, it was the same hope for James' readers. They knew Jesus had ascended. He had come. He died on the cross. He's the promised Messiah. He rose again from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. They knew the promises. They knew the Great Commission. They knew these things, brethren. They knew the power of the Spirit. They knew that, 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 that God had promised that their enemies would be destroyed and that righteousness and peace would abound. They knew all of that. But it wasn't happening for them. It wasn't happening. Instead, what do we find happening? They're being killed. They're being thrown in prison. They're being scattered from their homes. What is going on? This is not right, Lord. And brethren, as a, as a result, I mean, they're, they're asking themselves the same questions we'd ask ourselves. How are we going to fix this? <laughs> this is not okay. We're dying. You understand that? They were dying. They were going to jail. How could we fix this? We need to do something here. And what do they start doing? Well, we're going to look at it a little bit today and, 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 and throughout the rest of the book. Brethren, they're getting angry. <laughs> they're getting angry and they're ready to fight back. Brethren, they're not persevering in doing the words of Jesus Christ. They find that serving the weak is something that doesn't work and there's no time for that. 
There's no time to serve orphans and widows. We're being scattered around here. And James comes in and says, brother, and he comes in and says, he says, hold on a minute. Wait a second. Wait a second. Know this, my beloved brothers. What a gentle rebuke and encouragement. Know this, my beloved brothers. Know this. This is not how Christ taught us. This is not how Christ lived. This is not how our forefathers lived. David and Joseph and Jacob and Abraham. This is not how we learned Christ. This is not how God makes things right in the world. And He's going to instruct them. He's going to correct them throughout this letter and specifically here in this chapter. And brethren, for us, if we want God to make things right, if we want God to come in and fix things, brethren, fix things in your own personal lives, to fix things in your marriages, to fix things in our church, to fix what is not right in our community and in our city and in our nation and in our world, brethren. Then we need to heed James's words here in 19 to 27. We need to listen. We need to pay attention. How does this happen? How does God come in and make things right? And so... The title, brethren, of this sermon this morning is this. Bringing in God's righteousness. Bringing in God's righteousness. And I think really the key verse here and the overall theme of this section is in verse 20. You see it right there. He says, he says, uh, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For Verse 20. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, what is the righteousness of God? Brethren, I think that the, the, the easiest way for you to understand this is that in context here in James, the righteousness of God is God making things right. God being faithful to His promises. Now, sometimes in the Bible, the righteousness of God means means and, and, and is understood as, as the righteousness that God requires of us, namely like obedience and godliness. But, but here in James, the righteousness of God is God's promise to be faithful to what He has said. God's promise to do what is right, to make things right, to fix the world, to deliver His people. James is going to talk about later, uh, this, this harvest of righteousness, and it's the same idea. Now, I want you to hear a couple of verses here about the righteousness of God being understood as God making things right. Listen to, or being faithful to His promises. Psalm 23, 3. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. You know that psalm. There's a little text note there that says, or in right paths. God, lead us in the right way for your name's sake. We get it there in Psalm 70. Actually, you can just go to this one. Um, Psalm 71. I, I, I want to show you just a couple of these. I think it is an, an, an important idea here in the Bible. Psalm 71. And then we'll do Psalm 72, then I'm moving on. So Psalm 71 Listen to this here. Verse 1 and 2. In you, O Yahweh, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. We have a context here of suffering. Lord, in your righteousness, in your faithfulness to your promises. Lord, make this right and deliver me. Vindicate me, Lord. Save me out of my predicament. Lord, do what is right. Be faithful to your promises. We see it there in Psalm 72. Talking about the Messiah here. Look at verse 1 and 2. Give justice to your King, O God, and your righteousness to the royal Son. May He judge your peoples with righteousness and your poor with justice. And if you look up in the Bible, righteousness and justice often found right in parallel with each other. May He come in. May this royal Son judge your peoples with rightness. May He do what is right. May He uphold justice. May He come in and be a righteous King and do what is right. That's the call of the Scriptures. Lord, come. 
May he do this, Lord, please. And then we see it in Psalm 96 again, that God is going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to judge the world rightly. He's going to do what is right, brethren. Remember Abraham? Remember Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah? And he was saying, will not the, the, the God of all the earth do what is right? Yes, he will do what is right. Brethren, that's the idea here. So, so, so this producing this righteousness of God, for us to understand this, is, 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 is for how are we going to be conduits, how are we going to be agents that God uses to make things right in this world? Because He does do that, brethren. He does it through the church. He does it through God's people. And for James' readers, how are they going to fix this? How are they going to make things right? How are we going to bring in the righteousness of God? And I think for us, just to kind of uh, outline what, where we're going this morning, I think we've got three things here in this chapter. Uh, back to James 1. I want you to see this, brethren. How are we in our own lives, and how are these people here going to be used by God to make things right. Three things. Through the meekness of our actions. Through the meekness of our actions, through the steadfast obedience to the Word, and through our humble service. Three things. That's where we're going this morning. How is God going to make things right? When you have problems and issues in your life, how does God fix them? Brethren, you need to be people. You need to be people who through meekness of your actions, through steadfast obedience to the Word, and through humble service, ser seek and wrestle with the Lord. I want to show you these in turn now. Verses 19 and 20. Through the meekness of our actions. Brother, he says this right here. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Now look at what he says down in verse 26. He, he, he says it here also as well. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Brethren, being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And this whole idea, you get it all over the Proverbs, brethren. This is, uh, Aaron mentioned this last week as well. James is pulling here from the, from the Proverbs, from the wisdom literature. This is kingly wisdom. Brethren, how, this is how we're to, we are taught to rule in God's world. We are co-heirs and co-rulers with Jesus Christ. How do we as God's people rule in God's world? Right here. And brethren, we need to learn. We need to learn how to rule well. We need to learn how to rule well in our families, in our homes, in our communities, brethren. And we get this idea right here. Be quick to hear. Be quick to hear. Oh, brethren, do we not need to be people who are quick to hear? To slow down and listen. Proverbs 1.5. You don't need to turn there. I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to list some of these off. Proverbs 1.5. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. Listen. Listen. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. My son, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Listen to me. Open up your ear and listen. Proverbs 8.32. Now, O sons, this is wisdom speaking, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Brethren, how often is it the case when we face a little suffering <laughs> that we are not quick to hear? We're not quick to listen. We're quick often to speak and to lash out and to be angry. James says to be slow to speak. He does not say never speak. That would be also a pitfall on this end. But he says to be slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Think before you open up your mouth. <laughs> Using our mouth to rule well. I, I, I do want you to go to this. Go to Proverbs 10. I was thinking of how could I capture this in the Proverbs. And Proverbs 10 has, has a number of different verses um, 
that speak about speaking. I read uh, in, my, in my daily reading, I, I read a proverb a day every month. And whenever I get to Proverbs chapter 10, um, there's always good correction here. Proverbs 10, using our mouth to rule well. Look at verse 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. A fountain of life, brethren. Brethren, a fountain of life. Our tongues ought to be a fountain of life, speaking life into people, brethren. A fountain of life, our mouth. Look at uh, verses 18, 19, 20, 21. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent, slow to speak. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Brethren, we have got to be people who are using our mouth to rule well. To rule well, brethren. And we will and we do use our mouth to rule. But we need to rule like Christ. And I'm going to show you this in a minute. But brethren, restraining your lips. Oh, how difficult that is. Think about for these people. Brethren, they're dying. They're being dragged off into jail. And James tells them, be slow to speak. James, are you crazy? They're killing us out here. No. That's not how we rule well, brethren. And how easy it is for us, church. For me. For us. That when we suffer a little bit, we want to be quick to speak. Brethren, we've got to tame that. We've got to rule the tongue. We've got to be quick to hear, slow to speak. Our speech ought to be a fountain of life, brethren. We ought not be hasty. Not to be hasty. And listen, you know this. When you're hasty with your words, you get in trouble. <laughs> I don't need to tell you that. When you're hasty with your words and your marriages, you get into trouble. There's transgression there. When you're hasty with your words at work, trouble, transgression is not far behind. It's not lacking. When you're hasty with your tongue and your families and the church and the community, what have you, brethren? James says, no, be slow to speak. Don't never speak. Don't just be quiet and never talk. Say, I'm never talking again. No, no, no. No, no. That's the other pitfall. Okay? We need to speak. We're going to rule with our tongue and our mouth. But at the same time, we've got to be quick. We've got to be thought out, brethren. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, does he not? Let no corrupt talking come out of your mouth, but what is good for the edification, the building up of others, using your tongue to rule well. To rule well. Well, and brethren, listen, and I've had to come face to face with this a number of times. Whether we like it or not, our speech, brethren, our speech reveals our heart. It does. Because what does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth, what? Speaks. Brethren, whenever we're getting angry and we lash out at someone, that doesn't just happen in a vacuum. That's been stirred up. That's been in the heart dwelling and brewing. And then when someone upsets you, then you spill it out. Why? Because that's been in the heart, brethren. You know, I don't need to tell you this. You know this. It's been in the heart. Brethren, it ought not be. It ought not be amongst God's people. James says this, be slow to anger. Now notice the progression here. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. When you're quick to hear and you're slow to speak, guess what happens? You're slow to anger, right? If you are not quick to hear and you're quick to speak, what happens? You're quick to anger. <laughs> you see the progression there, brethren. That, that's the progression. 
And James says, be slow to anger. Why? Just because, well, you shouldn't do that because that's not Christian. No. It's not just some arbitrary moral command. Why does he say that? What's the, what's the point? That's not nice. No, that's not what he says. What does he say? Doesn't produce something, brethren. We're trying to produce something here. We want to make this situation right. And if you're not doing this, you're not going to produce good. We want to produce something. We want God to fix us. God, vindicate us. God, this, God, that. God, help me here. We want it. It's going to produce something. The intended desire for God to come in and make things right. Slow to anger, brethren. Proverbs 12, 16. A fool's anger is known at once, but the prudent ignore an insult. Oh, that's difficult, brethren, to ignore an insult. Proverbs 14, 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. But he who, is haste, who has a hasty temper exalts folly. I didn't need to search for Proverbs 14, 29, brethren. This is one that I have tucked away. This, this verse has always come in and cut me into my soul. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. They're a man or a woman of understanding. But whoever has a hasty temper exalts folly. Not producing what we want it to produce, which is good. I don't want to exalt folly. Do you want to exalt folly? No. No. Proverbs 16, 16 32. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You slow to anger, you're better than a mighty warrior. You're stronger than the one who goes and takes a city. Because you could rule your own spirit. You could rule your emotions. Brethren, it's through the meekness of our actions that God brings in His righteousness. And James' hearers, brethren, they were, they were facing intense persecution their lives were on the line. Easy to start getting angry. Easy to start opening the mouth and threatening. Easy to exchange reviling for reviling. Easy to go out and try to take vengeance upon yourself. That's easy to, to, to think about that. Yeah. And James says, this will not bring about God's rightness in the world. Remember David? Remember David? 1 Samuel 25. David and his men, they're out in the wilderness. And they come to Na a man named Nabal. Remember Nabal? And, and, and David and his men, they've been looking after Nabal's shepherds out, 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 out in the wilderness. And they've come on a feast day and they want some food. They're hungry and they're thirsty. They come to Nabal. And David says, you know, we, we want some food. Help us here. Remember what Nabal does? Does he help them out? He says, uh-uh. Who's David? Another runaway servant of Saul. I'm not giving him anything. Remember what David did? Did he ignore this insult? No, he wanted to kill all of them. And he marched right in to kill Nabal and all his men. And remember who came and saved him? His future wife, Abigail. Nabal's wife came in and said, No, 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 my lord, to David. Please don't do this. Nabal's a fool. Just ignore him. And David says, Oh, praise God, because I was going to come in and destroy him and your whole household. And God was teaching David a lesson there. David, that's not how you rule as my king. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Remember James and John, the sons of thunder? Look, turn, turn, to, turn to Luke 9. I want to show you this. Luke 9. James and John, the sons of thunder. That's a nickname that the Lord gave them. <laughs> Luke 9.51. Look at this. Luke 9.51. Luke 9.51. When the days drew near for Him, that's Jesus, to be taken up, He set His face to go to Jerusalem. And He sent messengers ahead of Him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for Him. But the people did not receive Him. 
Jesus because His face was set toward Jerusalem. And when His disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do You want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Lord, they didn't receive You. Lord, do You want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and destroy them and wipe them out? They're upset. They're angry. And what does Jesus say? But He turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Now look, I recognize that there's a textual variant here, and it's a textual variant for all the same, and that's good. But the textual variant there says, if you read down at the bottom of your Bible, it says that Jesus says, For the Son of Man, or you don't know what, kind of, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man came not to destroy people's lives, but save them. Now I, now, I get it. That's, that's, that's an addition later. That's why it's not in your Bible. There's a text note, textual variant. I get it. But brethren, the point is all the same. James and John, no. We don't just come in and call down fire from heaven to destroy people when we get upset. James and John, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James and John, i got to go to the cross. i got to suffer. i got to die. I'm going to come back and I'm going to save these Samaritans. We can't destroy them. That's not the way, John and James. That's not the way. The way is through the meekness of our actions. We don't just come to destroy people. Remember Peter? There in the garden, Matthew 26. He's with the Lord. And a big mob comes to take Jesus. And they lay their hands on Jesus. Remember what Peter did? Remember what he did? Yes, he took out his sword and started hacking. And he cut off the servant of the high priest, Malchus, his ear. And what does Jesus say? Yeah, do that. Slay all of them. No. Put your sword away, Peter. Put your sword away. Do you not know that I could appeal to my Father and He would at once send twelve legions of angels and destroy all this and wipe all them out? But He says, how would the Scriptures be fulfilled, Peter? I'm going to make things right in this world. And that path is the path of meekness. That path is a path of, of, of humbling oneself. It's a path of suffering. It's a path of overlooking all of this. Put your sword away. He who takes the sword dies by the sword, Peter. Put it away. I've I got to go to the cross. That's the path to kingship. That's the path of God bringing in His righteousness. The anger of man, Peter, does not produce the righteousness of God. Peter, I'm going to entrust myself to the one who judges justly. That's what Peter said. In the same context of suffering to, to, to Christians who are facing a similar situation. He teaches them how to suffer. Where do you think he learned that from? Jesus. <laughs> Committing himself to one who judges righteously. Brethren, we got to remember... The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When your co-worker disrespects you, when he or she accuses you, slanders you, you've got to remember, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Ladies, when your husband is harsh with you, when he's in sin against you, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Husbands, when your wife disrespects you, when she doesn't live up to expectations, when she falls short, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When your, when, your, when your children disobey you, and it's so easy to get upset, it's so easy to be quick to anger, it's so easy, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When your unbelieving family mocks you and they make your life miserable, the anger of man does not come in and make things right and produce good. Got to believe that, church. When we go out in evangelism, when we're rejected, called a fool, when Michael comes out on his blowhorn and starts yelling all kinds of obscene, gross things, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When people want to argue at First Friday, when, when you're standing outside the abortion clinic, people want to fight 
They want to duke it out. They want to yell at you. They want to do all kinds of things. Brethren, we've got to remember and walk in this. The anger of man does not produce good. It doesn't, brethren. We need to rule well with our mouth. James says here, uh, back in James chapter 1, he says, put away. That's what he says here. He's telling Christians this. We've got to remember that. He says, therefore, because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive them with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Brother, he's making a, he's making a comparison here. The anger of man with the way of meekness. There's two paths, two ways here. One of anger and one of meekness. He says, put it away and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Brethren, the way of meekness is the way of Christ. It's the way of Christ. And brethren, we, we, you guys know this. The meek will inherit the earth. That's what Jesus teaches us. And we look to Christ, brethren. we got to look to Him as the example. We have to. we got to imitate Him and follow in His footsteps. He's the mature man. He's the one who went through suffering. He's the one, brethren. He, we got to look to Him as our example. You know what it said of Christ? He's going to rule with His mouth. He's going to rule. You see this all over Isaiah. Isaiah 11.4 He will strike the earth with the rod of His mouth and with His lips He shall kill the wicked. Brethren, Jesus Christ will rule with His mouth. But first, He's got to bridle His tongue. His tongue is bridled first. We love that. Isaiah 53, we, we, we love that chapter. And what does it say there? He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet what? He opened not His mouth. He was silent like a lamb headed to the slaughter. He bridled his tongue in the midst of the most intense suffering and persecution anybody would ever face in the greatest trial. None of us will ever go through a trial like that. Not even close. Not even close. Yet he opened not his mouth. And the Gospels repeatedly say, brethren, as he's questioned, as he's got accusations made against him, as he's threatened, as he's slapped, as he's spit upon, mocked, beaten, he said nothing. Nothing. But in meekness he committed himself to him who judges justly. Brother, meekness is not passivity. It's not being passive. It's having a strong confidence in the power and faithfulness of God. That's what meekness is, brethren. It's not being indifferent. It's not being quiet just for quiet, quiet sake. It's putting your trust in something else, in someone else, the living God, who has promised to come in and make things right. He's promised it, brethren. Putting confidence in Him. Brother, we've got to follow the path of Christ. We've got to be those who come in and rule well. We have to believe the meek inherit the earth. And you know what? <laughs> If James tells his hearers this, <laughs> how much more ought we to obey this? I mean, anyone in here being driven from your home or parents being thrown in jail or you're being thrown in jail or killed? No. No. We ought to do it, brethren. We ought to ask God for help because we need help from Him. We need help from Him. Number two. The righteousness of God, he brings it in, brethren, through steadfast obedience to the word. James, again, makes a contrast here in verses 22 to 25 between two kinds of people. One who hears the word only and one who perseveres in doing the word. Now, again, the key here in this passage is we're looking at verse 25. He will be blessed in his doing. Brethren, the one who hears the word and perseveres is the one who will be blessed in his doing. They're going to bring about good. Brethren, do you want to be blessed in your doing? Do you, do you want God's blessing? I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Then we need to persevere and act in obedience. Brethren, it's easy to obey one time. It's easy to obey once. It's easy to obey probably twice. But brethren, James says we've got to persevere in it. Persevere. You hear the word. You do the word in persevering. That one will be blessed in his doing. Now listen. 
Christian piety, Christian maturity, being spiritual has nothing to do with how much you hear. You could hear all the good sermons you want. You could read all the good theological books you want. It doesn't matter how much you hear. You could listen to all the good podcasts or what have you. You could hear and hear and hear all the good stuff. It doesn't matter, brethren. Your spirituality, your godliness, your piety in the Christian life has everything to do with do you do the Word? Do you humbly submit yourself to the demands of Christ in the Gospel? Brethren, how much doctrine you know doesn't make you spiritual. Does it make you mature? Does it make you godly? If you could talk about all the theological topics, all the big ones, how much doctrines you know, how big your library is or is not, that has nothing to do with, with, with Christian piety, Christian spirituality, Christian godliness, none of it. doesn't matter how well you can talk about theonomy or covenant theology or progressive covenantalism or postmillennialism or Calvinism or election or biblical theology or typology or, or, or if you know the Westminster Confession of Faith or if you hold to the 1689. It doesn't matter. And you know what's great? is Most of you have no idea what I just even said. And you know what? That's okay. Don't let that discourage you. Oh, well, I don't know all the ins and outs of all the doctrine of a systematic theology. Yeah, and what's your point? Who cares? That doesn't make you godly. It doesn't matter how well you could talk about doctrine. Don't let that discourage you. Brethren, the most godly people in the church are those who hear the word and do it. <laughs> That's Christian maturity. That's Christian piety. That's Christian spirituality. All of that, brethren, is do you humbly come in and submit yourself to the demands of the Gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you obey Christ? Not how much you hear. Because brethren, listen, we have access to a lot of good things. And you should listen to good preaching. You should listen to a good podcast. You should read some good books. You should learn about biblical theology and systematic theology, and you should read the Puritans, and all that's all good. We should be doing that. Amen? But what good is it if you do all this stuff and you could talk all this big game and you don't do the simple things in the Scriptures, brethren? You don't love your neighbor as yourself. You have no compassion for the lost. You don't ever talk about Christ to anyone. You don't pray. You don't, you don't, you don't give. You don't... You don't you, you don't do anything. You just hear the Word. And you, don't, and you don't listen. You don't do it, brethren. That's what James is teaching here. That's what he's saying. Because what? The hearers only? What does he say here? They're deceived. Why? Because they forget. They don't do the Word. They go to the mirror of God's Word. They go to church weekly. And they see themselves. And they hear, like, oh, i got to make some changes here. Yeah, oh, that was kind of convicting. Oh, I need to do that. That was encouraging. And then they go away and they forget. They don't do the Word. And brethren, what, what, what James is saying here, be doer of the Word, not a hearer only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he is like. It'd be like you go and look in, into a mirror, brethren, into a physical mirror, and you see I got a bulging tumor coming out of my head. I got to fix that. That's a problem. And you go to the doctor, and you go away, and you forget that it was there. And you don't go to the doctor. And you come back to the mirror again. You go, whoa, I got a, I got a gaping tumor in my head. I need to go to the doctor. And you leave and you forget about it. And you come back and go, whoa, I got to go to the doctor. And you leave and you forget about it. And you know what happens over time? You come back down to the mirror and you go, oh, I'm looking pretty good. I'm doing all right. That's self-deception, brethren. Because you're not doing okay. You're actually in danger. You're actually in danger. You forget. 
But you know what James says? He doesn't tell the church, you need to do some introspection and you need, to, you need to wallow in your guilt and shame. He doesn't tell them that. He says, do the word. That's the exhortation. That, that word that you received with meekness, do it. Do it. Persevere in it. That's the encouragement. You see that how that's working there. He's not telling you, ah, oh, you, you need to look inside your own heart and you need to wallow in your sin. No, 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 no. You need to go, just do the word. And you'll be blessed in your doing. He's encouraging them, brethren. He's exhorting them. Persevere in doing the Word of God. Persevere in it. And you will be blessed. And brethren, how, how easy is that for us? Don't be a forgetful hearer of the Word. we got to listen. When, when you come to the Scriptures, brethren, this is, why the pro, this is why Psalm 1, we're going to read Psalm 1 next week. Blessed is the man who does what? Who, who doesn't do all these other things and who meditates on the Word day and night. And what is he like? He's like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. There's the blessing there. You see that? You come in, brother, you hear the Word and you think about it. You wrestle with it. You bring it into your life and you conform yourself to the Scriptures. That's the one who's going to be blessed in His doing. Simple doing of the Word. Now listen, he says in verse 25 here, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. What is this perfect law, this law of liberty? Brethren, this is, this is the teaching of Christ. This is Christ's teaching. He's going to connect this, the law of liberty, in chapter uh, 2, directly with the teachings of Jesus Christ. This perfect law. Remember what Aaron said last week about the word perfect? Kind of like a, we, we think perfect, and what do you think? You think like morally pure? But, but, but what did Aaron teach us last week? The, the, the word could be better understood as, yeah, maturity. The mature instruction, the mature law, the teaching of Christ. You persevere in what Jesus Christ has said. you got to persevere in what He's taught you, brethren. Can you think of anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says to His people, be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only? James is plagiarizing here. And it's okay. You can plagiarize the teachings of Christ. That's good. Good to do that. You think of anywhere in the, anything, that, anything that, that, that Jesus said about do the Word, don't just hear it only? Go ahead. Go ahead. Spit it out. Tell us, where at? That's right, Matthew 7, go there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? That one? Yeah. Matthew 7. This is something that I, I'm pretty sure Aaron said last week, but James is always a lot of times playing back to Matthew's Gospel. And here it is here. Listen to these words. Jesus just teaches the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and listen to what He says here. Verse 24, Matthew 7. This is Jesus speaking. Everyone then who hears these words of Mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Brother, there it is right there. There it is. Be a doer of the word. Jesus says, you do my word. And you'll be like a wise man. A wise man. You hear these words of mine and you don't do them? When the trouble comes, when the trials come, that's the context here in James, when the trouble comes, your house will fall. Brethren, it's important for us to be a doer of the Word. And we've got to think for a minute, brethren. Think about this for a minute. Those who humbly persevere in obeying and conforming their lives to what Jesus says, they're the ones, brethren, who bring in good into this world. Brethren, I mean, we look in church history and we marvel at people. Like, wow, look at what they did. And you know what they did? They just obeyed the Bible. <laughs> 
They just took God at His word and did it. They're not special. They just wanted to do the word of God. Brethren, don't despise the simple obedience of the Scriptures. Don't despise simple obedience. The Lord says, do this. you got to do it and trust Him that His ways are right and good. And we will have the promise, brethren, the promise of blessing on all that we do when we persevere in doing the Word of God. <sighs> Lastly here, brethren, how do we bring this in? How do we bring in good into our lives and into this world? The last one here. And I'm not going to touch on every single part in this section, but it's through our humble service, brethren. Through our humble service. Look at what he says here. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Brethren, there is a religion that changes the world. There is a religion that brings life to the dead, hope to those who are in darkness, and joy to the downcast. Brethren, there is a religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father. There is one, brethren. There is a religion like this. And it isn't worthless. And James says it's Christianity lived out in humble service of others, brethren. To visit orphans and widows and to keep yourself unstained from the world. Now listen, I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again. When he says to visit orphans and widows, he does not mean to go down to the orphan house and to go do crafts and do kumbaya with the kids and then leave. That's not what he's talking about. Brother, when God comes and visits His people, it's not to see how they're doing and pat them on the back. It's come to deliver them. To come and to enter into their lives and save them. Delivering them from trouble and hardship. And brethren, to, 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 to visit orphans and widows is to enter into their life with them, brethren. To enter into their life and be of help to them. That's what it means to, to, to save or, 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 or to visit them. Now you would think, James, why are you talking about this? This is kind of strange. You're bringing up orphans and widows. What? Brethren, think about it. What's happening to these people? They're being persecuted. They're dying. They're being thrown in jail. Mommy and daddy are no more. And now we got all these orphans. Maybe the husband died and now we got a wife. She's a widow. She's got to care for her family by herself. And James' readers, I mean, you can think about this, brethren. I mean, it, it would be easy to think we don't have time for that. We don't have time to serve the least of these. We, got other, we, we have bigger fish to fry. And James says, no, 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 no. You want pure and undefiled religion? You come in and you serve the least of these. You come in and you serve, brethren. That's a temptation because you're going to give an account for it on the day of judgment. Again, alluding to Matthew 25 again. That's what Jesus said. Welcome into the kingdom. You fed the poor. You clothed the naked. You visited the sick. You visited me. You did this to the least of these, my brethren. You did it to me. I mean, brother, we're going to be judged based upon whether we did this or not. And the Bible has a lot to say about caring for the poor, the weak, and the needy, and the fatherless, the least of these. The Bible has a lot to say about it, brethren. Jeremiah 22, 15 to 17. This is what it means to know God. Brethren, this is what it means to rule with Christ. Biblical kingship is all about serving and all about generosity, caring for the weak, caring for the least of these. Caring for the outcasts and the marginalized. Remember what Jesus said in, in, in Mark chapter 10? You can turn there. We're almost done here. Mark 10. James and John. Here they are again. James was taught a lot by the Lord. James and John, they want to come and they want to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus. They want to rule in His kingdom with Him. They want the best seats. Jesus says, oh, yo, you do, do you? You want, you want to sit next to me? Well, it's not mine to give. And then, and then look at what he says in uh, verse 40. He says, but to sit at my right hand 
of, of Mark 10. To sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten, the other uh, apostles, or disciples heard it, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, he's about to teach them, what does it mean to rule with Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? He says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, your slave. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as a ransom for many. Brethren, there it is right there. Humble service of others. That's what Jesus requires of His people. You want to be great in this world, brethren? You serve. <laughs> you put yourself last. That's very uh, antithetical to how our world thinks. The Gentiles, the nations, ungodly people. What do they do? They lord it over. They're harsh. They're a harsh master. Not so with Christ. He girds Himself and serves us, brethren. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The Son of the living God came not to serve, but to serve. He was a servant, brethren. And He showed us the way. This, this is how you do it, James and John and all you disciples. This is what biblical kingship is all about. Consider these men, brethren. David, what did he do? Methibosheth, remember him? His dad died, Jonathan. He's crippled in both feet. And he shows him compassion and grace and mercy. Brings him into his house. Brings him to sit at his table. And treats him like a son. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. David serving the least of these. The orphan. Remember Boaz. Boaz, that mighty man of valor. What's he doing? Serving widows. <laughs> Having compassion for the least of these. Bringing Ruth into his house and caring for her. Protecting her. Providing for her. That's biblical kingship, brethren. Job, a great king of the east. He says in Job 29.12, I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. Brethren, that's what kingship looks like. That's what it means to rule with Christ. Serving one another. And we have promises with that, brethren. We read it in, 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 in Isaiah 58. Brethren, when we give ourselves to the poor and needy, to the fatherless and the widow, God says, here I am when we call to Him. Here I am. And He comes to answer, brethren. We give ourselves to that. Look, look at... I, I, I am almost done. I, I, you, you need to see this. Because it's encouraging because it ties into what I'm talking about, about bringing in good into this world. And I love when, when, when Nick read this, our Old Testament reading. This is what he says. And Yahweh will guide you continually and when you give yourself to all this. okay? And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a well or, or, or shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Listen, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Brother, you're going you're gonna to fix the ancient ruins. <laughs> you're going to fix things. Things are going to happen when you give yourself to this because God's going to come. <laughs> through you, your ancient ruins will be rebuilt. The foundations of many generations will be raised up. You'll be the repairer of the breach. That sound like bringing good into this world? Yes, it does. And we have promises. When we give ourselves to that, brethren, God will act. He will come. He will come, brethren. Now listen. Now I recognize that we haven't had a ton of opportunity to do this. You say, Manny, Where's all the orphans and widows at that we could care for them? Well, I don't know. They're not on the street over here, all these orphans and widows. They were in Mueller's day. They were running all over the street there in Bristol. And he cared for them, brethren. But we don't have orphans and widows all around us, but we need to think outside the box a little bit. And, I, and, and I'm starting to think, what, what have we done as a church already just in wanting to serve and love Christ 
in this kind of category. Think about Angelina. Angelina was very well fatherless and motherless, so to speak. And we cared for her as a church. Lived with the Osunas. Hendrixes tried to take her in. Caring for her. Caring for Maritza. Some of you guys sent Christmas presents or birthday, or, or birthday presents or, 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 or whatnot to her this past week. Brother, when she was here, we cared for her. That should encourage you. Yes. When we had opportunity, it, it came. I was just thinking about Drew. Drew, remember, remember Drew was deathly sick? You know, we went to his house and just tried to encourage the brother, visiting the sick. And I don't say this to toot our own horn, brother, but I'm just saying we've got to think about when these opportunities come. You know, things like when Lydia needed a place to live, coming in and just trying to help a sister here. Then I thought I'd think about the next step ministry. Brother, we've been praying. God, give us opportunity. God, help. we want to help the fatherless. Those that, whose moms are, have killed their siblings and you know, they're abortion-minded and they spared this one. And uh, Lord, we want to help these people. We want to help them, Lord. And there's... Kelsey, going down to the Next Step ministry. My wife has went, and I would encourage you ladies to go and join them. Go and join them. Kelsey's not an expert. Kelsey, you an expert in uh, ministering to abortion-minded moms? You got a PhD in that? Go to seminary for that? Nope. Nope. Aaron, were you an uh, expert in uh, helping raise Angelina and her mom? <laughs> Nope. We, I have a yeah. <laughs> and they never taught you that in seminary. Yeah, useless, exactly. But, brethren, what's the point there? Just want to serve the Lord. And when opportunities come up, brethren, you know, when Louise, Louise is not a widow, but she lives alone when she moved. I thought that was encouraging. Just little things, brethren, going and helping a sister move. You know how many people, how many Christians move and hire a moving company? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. They don't call upon the church to help, and the church doesn't care to help. Just little things like that, brethren. As God gives us opportunity, just reach out. Lord, how? And we ought to be praying and on the lookout and thinking outside the box a little bit, brethren. It doesn't mean that we're special Christians. We're not special. We don't have a special calling. It's trying to be biblical. It's trying to be biblical. You know, I was thinking about the dispatches uh, uh, episodes, and... You know, something that I love watching those is when they show people uh, that, are, that, are, that are the locals doing ministry, which is, a, which is a lot of them. I know you guys watch the one on Cambodia, and, you know, the guy's a linguist, and, yeah, you know, he's, you know, whatever, okay? But, but in a lot of these, and the one that we watched the other week, these people are not experts reaching out to orphans and Filipinos and caring for autis autistic children in China. Have you ever watched that one? They're, they're not experts in any of these things. And he says that in there. I love that. He says these people aren't experts in how to do this. They're just reaching out with the love of Christ. Brethren, that's what it's all about. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be specially called. It's just biblical. Serving the least of these, brethren. And we have promises that our ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. We will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Rebuilding, brethren, as we are out humbly serving the least of these. You know, you think of uh, what it says there in Isaiah 41. This is my last verse. Because I was thinking about what's going on there in Myanmar. And I'm not going to say the people's names here. Um, But we have good examples around us, brethren, and we have precious promises. Listen to this. Psalm 41. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, Yahweh delivers him. Yahweh protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. Yahweh sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. Brethren, there's a compound of people caring for orphans 
and bombs are being dropped all around that place. Bombs are hitting the walls and blowing holes in the walls. And God is sustaining them and protecting them. Why? Because His Word is true, brethren. He delivers him in the day of trouble. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. Brethren, those are promises for us. It's not in vain to serve the orphan and the widow. It's not a vain thing to serve the least of these. God takes that serious because that's who God is. God's a father to the fatherless. He's a protector of widows. And when we walk in that, brother, we are imitating Christ. We are walking the path of kingship. We're walking the path of maturity. And that's a blessed path, brethren. It's a blessed path to walk with our king. And we have examples all around us. Just mentioned one in Myanmar. Got the brothers up there in Lebanon. I'm not going to say their name. Pray for them constantly. What are they doing? Giving themselves to the poor and needy. Spreading the gospel. Having favor there among the people. It's everywhere, brethren. That's how it's done, church. That's how it's done, James says. We come in and we walk in meekness. We come in and we be a doer of the Word. We come in, brethren, and we serve the least of these. And in all that, that will produce the righteousness of God. Let's pray.